Welcome to the section of our podcast we call In Conversation With, where we sit down with sports industry experts, women in sports and thought leaders and pioneers within the industry. My name is Lorraine and I'm joined by my co-host Patricia. Together with our amazing guests, we'll be discussing working data-driven, increasing visibility for women in sports and leveraging tools such as a sports customer data platform to grow your supporter base, get superior sales, and earn real revenue. So without further ado, let's meet our guests. Our next guest has quite an incredible story about how she got started within the sports industry. She is the founder and managing director of a sports agency called Sisu Sports Management, representing male and female football players, staff and clubs, as well as providing merch and services to clubs, Lindy Nguenya is passionate about serving emerging football markets across Africa, Scandinavia, the United States of America, and in women's football. And today we get to step into her world and share her incredible story with you. Lindy, welcome to the podcast. I Thank you, Lorraine. Really good to meet you and Patricia as well. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. We really appreciate it and we're excited to share your story with our audience, just as we said. Um, but before we begin, we like to start off our sessions with an icebreaker. Are you ready for that? Okay. Perfect. What's your favorite quote, expression or motto and why is it your favorite? Okay, so I've got a confession to make. I'm a bit of a closet hater of quotes, you know, mottos, etc especially these days because they're so overused they're thrown around it's almost like kind of you know I call it like social media posters you know everywhere so you know I I think like not so much going down the quote phrase I think someone like Bob Dylan is a songwriter who has always inspired me with his lyrics and and things like that you know sort of lyrics from poems um artists and writers who who really kind of you know fire my imagination and inspire me they're they're the people that kind of really you know get me going so to speak or get my juices going so I would um basically direct everyone to one of Bob Dylan's songs uh it's from his album Bring It All Back Home which is one of his earlier kind of folk albums and the song is It's All Over Now Baby Blue uh I think literally it's it's a song about the breakup of a relationship and sort of moving on to new pastures but I think it's more metaphor about life and you know how you know things or all things can come to an end uh, even whether we want them or not but also having a positive perspective in terms of looking ahead and striking out again so it's all over now baby blue by bob dylan put that in your um put that in your phone have a listen that's what i recommend oh that's fantastic I guess what I got when you were saying that, how I interpreted it is that like not all endings are to be just cried over. They're not the end of the world. They're possibly even the beginning of something new, you know. So I, I'm going to listen to that as well. Yeah, for sure. I've actually not heard that song. So now I'm really curious. I'll have a listen now after our interview. Uh, like Lorraine said in the introduction, you have quite the incredible story of how you got started in the sports industry. Uh, So would you like to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, where to begin, I guess. So I guess it always begins from where, you know, where did the passion come from for sport? And and for me as a young girl growing up, you know, in a football mad household, you know, we were in London at the time. It was back in the 80s. I remember vividly my earliest memories were Tottenham Hotspur winning the FA Cup. Uh, in the early 80s and they had a couple of Argentinian players Ricky Villa and Ozzy Ardiles and you know I think at that sort of age when you're very impressionable uh, it can kind of really sort of lead on into your sort of adult life and for me yes yeah, sport has always been the sort of backdrop I guess to my life and it's the passion I've always had uh, unfortunately I was in that sort of generation where being able to play football was very very difficult as a girl you know, you know, back in the eighties and nineties, there wasn't really football provided for girls, and if you tried to push for it, you know, there there wasn't many places you could play the game. But as I sort of grew into sort of late teens and early twenties, and I went to university, uh, I ended up playing rugby at university and really started to get into the whole playing sport aspect. So after university, 
I then played um, club rugby for a while at Blackheath. And I think it's those years um, kind of together with obviously my what is still my first love and will always be my first love for football really kind of instilled something into me that I wanted to be involved in sport. And, um, you know, it was a question of when would I get, you know, when would I basically take that step? Because when I left university, I went into the army for a few years and, um, you know, I did that partly because it enabled me to play rugby. So combine my rugby playing with, you know, having a sort of career as such. Uh, and then when I left the military, I went into the city, uh, worked as a financial trader for 10, 11 years. And again, you know, as I sort of the years sort of elapsed in the financial markets, I kind of got to the point where, you know, that big question of how am I going to get into sports? When am I going to get into sports? Start to loom larger and larger. Long and short of it is probably about 10 years into my financial services career, I started to really actively look at ways as to how I could become part of the sports industry. And when I sort of did that sort of research and looking around and reaching out, obviously, to people, I, I did sort of think and I, I came to a conclusion quite quickly that sports management was going to be the, the best area for me, uh, part because it combined my own personal experience playing rugby or playing sport. Uh, it combined, obviously, the experience and the skill I had, the leadership, the, the personal development that involves for me and also for other people who work with me and the, how much that interested me. And also, you know, I, I thought the managing players was, you know, was something that I could add value to. So, yeah, I decided, you know, the sort of remaining two years of my financial career was, you know, what's the latest phase now? Sort of quiet quitting. I think I did sort of quiet quit a little bit for my financial services career as I, I started to work towards leaving the business and starting up my sports management company. And that was the, the last sort of big question I had to answer for myself is, did, did I want to sort of enter an existing company and sort of make my name and then maybe strike out on my own in the future? Or did I want to kind of start from the ground up? And I, I went for the latter and I started CC Sports Management in 2013 off my own back, my own company. And uh, from the outset, it was really about sort of working with underserved, untapped markets. Football was the market for me. As I've said already, it's always been my first love. Rugby is a, is a sport that I have a passing interest in. And actually, you'll probably see over the next few months and years that that passing interest will get folded more into the um, agency business. But yeah, football has been the, the sport that we've started with. And that's what we've progressed with quite strongly since 2013. You mentioned that you wanted to incorporate some of your personal experiences into into whatever you would do within the sports industry that is your business, your agency. But I'm wondering, I know that you have training, you education in uh, as an engineer. Have you been able to to integrate that into your career right now in sports? Interesting question. I mean, I think actually an engineering qualification and all the, the, the sort of learning off the back of it is actually a really good grounding for a lot of professions. And actually, if you talk to like, the, you know, the management consultancies of the world, like the McKinsey's, et cetera, you'll find that they do like to kind of fish in a pool of like engineers because, you know, what engineering generally does, it, it's about problem solving. So, the, you know, if you go through that sort of education, you generally have a more problem solving orientated uh, approach to things. Uh, you generally look to structure things. And again, that's really, really important, you know, A, from a business you know running a setting up a business establishing the business and growing it I think you know you need to have a plan you need to have some sort of structure and then that sort of follows through to managing players and coaches and other personalities careers right you know you're you're kind of helping them to map a path out for themselves both on the pitch and off the pitch and you know being having that mindset where you're you know you're trying to create you know a structure uh, maybe a good sort of good processes that they can kind of work towards I think engineering really does help that a lot now where you know where you could say that I've maybe fall down a little bit or sometimes you know the finger will be pointed at engineers like ourselves is they'll say we lack creativity but again I would say that that would be an accusation that would be looking at us in a very narrow prism you know, maybe I'm not creative in the sense that, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, my, my drawing is appalling. You know, I do stick men and women <laughs> if I'm doing art. But I, I do think like as a problem solver, you, you have to be creative 
in, you know, in kind of the way you approach problems and how you, you know, find solutions for them. So, yeah, I like to think that engineering has been a great grounding. I was really interested in that question because before I got into marketing, I was in acting and people would always ask me like, okay, so how did the two connect? And it's, I guess, a lesson from that is always kind of like nothing is wasted, you know, things always relate somehow. It's never like, oh, jumping from A and then completely going into the opposite direction. And even if it was, there is always kind of like that connection of how you can take what you've learned from from the past into into the new so um thank you so much for for indulging me with that one because that was that one was for me personally absolutely i mean i was just going to say i think you know the the phrase is transferable skills most transferable skills are soft skills right you know it's like the ability to communicate you know the the relationship management all of that stuff these are soft skills that you develop over time usually with work experience and a certain amount of basic empathy uh, and then, you know, the, the work specific skills, the knowledge you need to do the job. But yeah, that's that's a lot of that. As long as you've got the ability to learn and you're coachable, you can probably kind of move into a lot of roles apart from very, very, very kind of deep technical roles where you have a long kind of training period. So, you know, I'd agree, Lorraine, as a, you know, as a former actor going into your role now, it's there's lots of things you can transfer over. Absolutely. I'm just wondering, though, like, where does your passion for representing players specifically from emerging markets come from? Like another path would have been maybe to go into a market that's already kind of ripe and ready and then just go into it and just make a killing, that kind of thing. But but where does your passion for representing players and also underrepresented players from emerging markets come from? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, there's a number of reasons for it. I mean, from a personal perspective, obviously, coming from, you know, having African parents and, you know, effectively being, you know, the child of Zimbabwean parents, you know, there's a certain amount of awareness that I think, you know, my parents were moving to the UK the time they did. Um, if you look at, you know, the, the situation economically and everything in Zimbabwe as it is now, looking back on it, I think I was very fortunate to be born over here in the UK uh, at the time. And, you know, I benefited, I guess, from the coincidence of birth location. So, you know, to a certain extent, a part of me feels an obligation to maybe try and serve and support players and talents who are still in places where they don't have the same opportunities, um, where the, you know, economic hardships are there and make it very, very difficult for them to reach their full potential. So there's an aspect of that. Um, another aspect is I think naturally I, I am a little bit of a supporter of the underdog, I, you know, regardless of my own sort of personal kind of background and journey. I, I've always been a, a little bit more kind of leaning towards the underdog. So, you know, again, you know, if I'm going to look at maybe where I'm going to favour committing some of my energies, it, it's probably always going to be more kind of underserved. And as you've just mentioned, emerging markets where the opportunities are not as rich for the talent there and then thirdly you know I, I do have a you know a harder business head so to speak and I guess the harder business head is that you know I'm we're based here in the UK and you know for certainly for men's football at least the the UK is a very very mature market there's lots and lots of competition there's lots of agents so you know to be able to differentiate yourself there and really make a mark and like you say start really killing it I think is actually not that straightforward and not that easy, um, especially coming in as a relatively, you know, new player into a mature market, as you well know. And, you know, the ways you can do that and make an impact is maybe have deep pockets, which, you know, starting up my own company is, I wouldn't, you know, I definitely didn't fall into that bracket or coming from a slightly different angle. So for me, for, for the UK, particularly England and Scotland, you know, the, the area that I've always kind of worked on has been the women's football, because back in 2013, the WSL in England was only two years old, you know, and even then the, the game, the women's game in England wasn't professional. That you know, the game became professional around 2018. So that seemed to be a, you know, an area that if we really kind of put the work in, we work with the talents, we work with those underdog uh, type players and stories, I felt long term that that would bring real value to the players as well as obviously to the company. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's really starting to come to fruition now, particularly what's happened over the summer with the Euros and, you know, the, the growth of women's sport and women's football in particular. 
And that brings us to, of course, uh, CISO Sports Management, which um, uh, you founded. And why would you say that process was starting um, CISO Sports Management, like looking at the process itself? Yes. Yeah, so, like, you know, I started CISO Sports Management. And as you probably already heard from my story so far, I kind of went into it without any prior experience specifically in sports management and also not really with a ready-made network. So, for instance, if you're a former footballer, you know, you've got a ready-made network of fellow players that you've played with, coaches, you know, club staff, etc. So you've already got a little bit of a, a head start in being able to go into that line of work. So I guess I effectively pretty much, as I mentioned, starting from the ground up. So I looked at what I needed uh, to have in order to be effective in the role. And certainly, you know, for any role, you need specific knowledge about the role. So, for instance, you know, what do, what knowledge did I need to have to become, you know, a football agent or a sports agent in particular? So on that side, the way I addressed that was by doing a couple of courses uh, about football agency, understanding the, the regulations around, you know, working as a football agent. And actually back in 2013, in order to become uh, to be able to work with players as an agent, you had to do an exam. So it's an exam set by FIFA, which they're actually they abolished um, literally three months after I got the ex past the exam. But they're now reintroducing or well, that's going to come in again with the new kind of agency kind of regulations that are coming in, I think, later this year. But essentially, to, to be a licensed agent, you had to do an exam. And it was a very difficult exam that the pass rate was something down towards about 15, 20 percent. Right. So most people failed this exam. So there's a lot of work you had to do around the, you know, the laws of football, the regulations, et cetera, to be able to pass the exam. And that was a good thing because, like I said, it, it, it forces you to obviously learn about the job of being an agent and what's required. And that's why I took the courses. And in doing the courses, that was probably then the first step towards the next piece, which is being able to develop a network so that you, you know, when you're actually, when you've got a talent or a player, right, you know, when you start out, you're not going to get the best players. Again, unless you've got some sort of advantage, like you're a famous ex-player and people will just sign because of your name. So when you don't, when you start off and you don't have maybe like the best players or you've got kind of young emerging talents who are not known, clearly the biggest task is then bringing them to the attention of clubs and academies etc and the only way you can do that obviously is to have some contacts you know you need a network so you know the the biggest part of the role and and still is a big part of the role. i'd say i devote at least 20 percent a week of my time to what i call business development continuing to develop my network cultivating my existing network a lot of that was around developing my network so the courses that i did obviously were good first steps attending conferences i remember going to things like soccer x um this is a big football conference at the time to meet clubs to develop those networks meeting with other agents that is all the stuff that i sort of put together to try at least given the framework where a i knew what i was doing and secondly once i get players on board i knew how to go about getting them the opportunities that they're looking for and then the sort of the third piece that comes in then is is the stuff that you kind of learn along the way that maybe you're not so you didn't realize at the time that you would need. And, you know, just I think general business acumen is really, really important to have as an agent. At the end of the day, you are you know, you are running a, a business that's based on kind of attracting clients, um, helping to promote those clients. But at the same time, you know, in order to then be able to continue to turn that wheel, you need to get a you know a throughput of new clients you need to then with your existing clients know how to manage that workflow around you know continuing to develop their career and giving them the right sort of service so i've learned a lot of business general business management skills um productivity uh you know kind of hacks and all that sort of stuff that comes around just running a business wow that's really impressive um uh, it's a lot of work uh, as you have uh, described so far and what would you say was there was something that helped you on that journey going through this whole process I'm sure there are uh, many things but if like one key takeaway what would that be yeah it's it's very difficult I would say to give one key takeaway I I think that 
ultimately you know in anything in life but particularly i would say in in business particularly in the area of sport and high performance sport where there's such highs and lows um for your clients in particular that you have to you you have to have a fairly balanced temperament so you know when things are you know when you hit the highs don't be doing cartwheels and high fives and going absolutely crazy all the time and then when you hit the lows, you know, don't be banging your head against the wall and, you know, pulling your hair out and wailing because otherwise the whole thing becomes an emotional roller coaster. It's not sustainable and actually it's just not it's just not very healthy. So, you know, you've got to have, I think, a balanced perspective on life, uh, try to inject some humour <laughs> into proceedings, but also always have always look through things with a positive kind of lens. So when bad things happen, try and turn them into positives. Like I said, when positives happen, you know, enjoy, celebrate, you know, with your clients. But, you know, that's not the be all and end all. You know, around the corner, you could get hit by a lorry. So, there we go. I love that. Basically, have a balanced approach to everything that comes and everything you do. Yeah. Um, that's really great. So uh, we know that CISO has a strong presence in, in Africa. And would you like to tell us a little bit more about the choice to uh, establish a presence there and how it's going and uh, what your hopes are for the future? Yes, sure. Yeah, I mean, like I said, from the beginning in 2013, we, we have always defined ourselves as working um, with underserved markets and with untapped markets. And clearly Africa, you know, as a continent, you know, squarely kind of fits into that definition. Um, but really up until the beginning of this year, we kind of worked from the outside looking in, so to speak. You know, so we're based here in the UK, you know, and whilst the, our presence has been growing steadily um, across here in the UK and across Europe, and we didn't, we've done more deals from Africa or into Africa and out of Africa, we didn't actually have a physical presence in Africa with an office. So I decided that... Um, the beginning of the year was the time to address that now it should have actually been more like 2020 but we all know what happened in 2020 uh with regards to the c word so that really delayed things for us a little bit in terms of when we wanted to open an office in africa but yeah beginning of this year in february we established sisu africa which is which is based in nigeria um Duji good luck is my managing partner over there and that was us really sort of staking our flag in the ground, uh, showing our commitment, demonstrating our commitment to the continent, because, you know, I'm strongly of the view that, you know, if we're working, looking forward into the future, the sports ecosystem in Africa is underdeveloped compared to a lot of other parts of the world, clearly Europe and America. But that is something that is is going to happen over the next 10 to 20 years in Africa. And we strongly believe in that. And we also want to be one of the players involved in making sure that development happens. So we've opened CC Africa uh, in terms of the business functions. It's similar business functions to CC Sports Management. So it's the representation, you know, the endorsements and a certain amount of consultancy. However, there's a, a slightly different emphasis, I would say, versus some of the stuff we're, we're doing over in Europe and America in the sense that we're trying to look at building the ecosystem holistically along with the business we do. So to give an example, at the moment, we're developing a, a tech platform um, that is designed to facilitate some of the, the showcasing and the, the, the talents um, that basically are in Africa to clubs and colleges. But as part of that tech platform, we're embedding a kind of a rev share with our African partners. And the idea is about driving the, obviously development of the game, but making sure that the benefit of that also gets reinvested back into the continent. So yeah, it, it is a little bit more of a social enterprise um, sort of business hybrid, I would say, in terms of the emphasis that we've got for CSU Africa. Yeah, and that's that's so incredible as well because I mean uh, statistics on uh, the growth of populations and stuff like that show that I I don't know if it's twenty fifty or something like that that mostly 
all the rest of the continents will be like in the negatives, whilst in Africa, that's where all the young people, young women, young men, young everyone will be coming up. So in a way, it's like physically as well, by 2050, we would need to rely a little bit more on Africa to get people that would be actually physically fit enough to play in this in these games in terms of new players younger players and all that kind of stuff yeah you're onto something there i think yeah and i think it's very forward thinking yeah so just to expand a little bit on what you say in terms of you know you mentioned 2050 that's right you know you will find that the majority of the working age population in the world is is going to be in the african continent so you've got a huge amount of human capital effectively uh, in that one continent But as we well know, you know, the financial capital, the venture capital is concentrated in what we call, you know, traditionally the Western world. And there has to be some sort of transfer for mutual benefit, because as we all know, you've got aging populations in the West, but you still need human capital. You need that talent to help drive the economies and Africa needs the capital. Uh, So, you know, just from a kind of a broad based um, macro view, you know, I think, you know, you have to invest in the talent in Africa. And uh, that's something that we, you know, we are wanting to lead the way on. And I absolutely agree. Like we have to create some kind of shared value and create, like you said, mutual, mutually beneficial. I think that's the key word there, that we're not just trying to get as much human capital as possible for as little as possible, because then that puts that puts the continent kind of on the same trajectory, you know, or like on a worse off trajectory. So I completely, completely agree. But in light of everything that you've said, in, in light of um, having to do your exams, starting from from the ground up, taking time before actually fully committing to the idea of going into sports until you were kind of at, at a point in your life where you thought, OK, I, I really have to do it, where it's like really loud in, in your inside of you, in your head that you really need to take this step. What would you say throughout that whole process was the most challenging thing or I mean, I know that it, sometimes it's not just one thing, but what few things do you do you remember that made it particularly challenging for you at times? I think it's um, the most challenging stuff was doing the stuff I hadn't done before. So, you know, things like taking exams, you know, I'd, I'd gone for university, you know, done well academically. I'm quite good at taking exams. That's all familiar stuff. So that was all easy, you know, tick that off. But I'd really, from university, effectively been in what you'd call safe, secure, salaried roles, you know. Every month you get a paycheck, you know, at the end of the day, you know, wake up, you know, eat, sleep, rinse, repeat, you get a paycheck. When you start your own business, that is a completely different lifestyle. You know, you, you literally have a, a blank canvas and everything that you get is can only come from what you put into it. So it was a hard transition, kind of making that transition from having the security of that paycheck and the, the security it gives you as well in terms of decision making and other bits and pieces like that to start your own business and really having to sort of forge your head into the unknown, so to speak. So I, it took me a little while. I mean, I, you know, I did the, again, I, I did the sort of textbook stuff because, you know, I'm a textbook kid and I can do that. So, you know, I started off with a business plan. Fine. It's it's always good to start with a plan. But as Mike Tyson said, you know, a plan's only as good until you get punched in the face. And, you know, like in business, you, you do get punched in the face quite a lot. And, you know, I got punched in the face early and had to reassess a few things uh, and had to readjust a few things and, and readjust my own kind of lifestyle uh, to, you know, cut my cloth accordingly, you know, because like I said, you know, the health of the business, you can have a very great vision, you can have a near term, a healthy business, but things like cash flow, uh, you, you know, you have to be on top of in terms of managing for a business, because if you don't manage things like cash flow, then those are things that can make a, a good business in terms of the model um, and the concept and everything fall over. So making that transition from being, you know, a salaried worker to to an entrepreneur, that's something that, you know, I certainly took a while to adjust to and to become comfortable with. Thinking back to what you said before, once again, if you have a balanced approach, then that those uh, things that you just talked about will be easier. But nevertheless, of course, they are still challenging. So you need to be resilient, which 
you indeed are. Uh, what would you say has been the most rewarding aspect of your journey so far? Yes, uh, look, you know, whenever you're working, you know, in with people and, you, you know, we're in the business of, you know, dreams. You know, at the end of the day, not very many people are able to become professional sports people. Many, many, you know, people aspire to get to that pinnacle, but not many people achieve it. So, you know, we're in the business of making dreams to a certain extent come true or facilitating that. And yeah, the, the best moments in a job are always when, you know, you, you've helped to improve, you know, a, a player's career or help to break them into, you know, their professional career, something they may have been trying to do or striving to do since they were a child and to have actually, you know, help them to sign their first professional contract, for instance, that those are really, really rewarded moments. And, you know, for me, it's it, it's always a privilege to be able to work with players i think that is it you know that's that's the big difference between i would say what i would call good agents are the ones who you you sense that they've got their heart in there and it's something they know that it's a privilege to do and they want to kind of give themselves to improving those players lives and make giving them those players those dreams versus bad agents who it's more a case of an extractive thing where they see a talent and it's about what they can get out of the talent you know they they're making a calculation as they look at a player or a coach what they can get out of it for themselves so yeah that's that's there's lots of rewarding things in the job but it, it is always about helping players and and the other coaches and people we work with to achieve their dreams fantastic um lindy you are a woman in an industry that is dominated by men not only that but you're also a woman of color have these two aspects ever intersected in any way to influence your experience within the sports industry, either for the good or for the for the worse, or have they never really been vectors? So the the question of being a woman and like you mentioned, you know, being a woman of colour, I think, you know, I would be naive and also yeah, I, I would be kind of brushing things off. Uh, if I said that clearly there there hasn't there has been some sort of effect there. I mean, what I would say is that even from a very young age, uh, I've always taken the view that a little bit what I said earlier about putting a positive prism on life, right? I've always taken the view that you know being you know a black girl and a black woman, you'll stand out in a country like, for instance, the UK where it's majority white. You will stand out. So. And you, that can be a positive and a negative. Clearly, the negative is if you have to deal with, you know, regressive attitudes, racism, etc. The positive aspect of it is that, generally speaking, you are more memorable than others, you know, within their own kind of, you know, majority group. So if you stand out in a good way or, you know, you do a good job, I found generally that people will tend to remember you more or you can, you know, you can trade off that a little bit because if you go to someone two years time, oh, you remember me? I did that. And they're like, oh, yeah, I remember. And that's that's generated a lot of positive things for me. So my perspective is, yes, you know, I'm sure I know, obviously, I've encountered sort of, you know, prejudice and, and stuff like that in my life. But it has also worked in my favor to a certain extent because because I've stood out, I've been able to kind of maybe find those opportunities uh, that, you know, if I'd kind of blended in with the crowd, wouldn't have been so easy to find as well. So you've got to have a little bit of a, again, that sort of resilient, um, tougher kind of attitude where, you know, you, you really just got to kind of focus yourself on what you want, um, how you want to achieve it, and know that there's, you know, for every bad person out there, there are actually people who want to kind of reach a hand out and who want to, you know, help you up, so to speak. And that's what you kind of try and zone in on and focus on, rather than getting dragged down too much by the negativity that is always going to be there. There's always going to be naysayers. There's always going to be negative people, right? It's how you process that and how you deal with that negativity that will define you. So let's just, you know, scrunch it up, put it in a ball, throw it back in their face, <laughs> and, you know, you kind of work towards the, the people who are positive and want to kind of give, that sort of helping hand along the way. In terms of specifically about football, because I think football is a singular industry in its in its own right. You know, 
you know, I think traditionally, you know, we all know a little bit about the history about women's football and how women's football was basically strangled essentially at birth in the 20s when it was banned for 50 years. You know, football has this sort of space where I think some men still, a lot of men still see it as like their space, like a masculine space. And, you know, the, you know, the sort of their view is the encroachment of women into their masculine space is very threatening to them, which is why you see a lot of the trolling, a lot of negativity on social media I've seen around women's football. So I think football as an industry is is gradually modernising. You know, there's more and more progressive people involved in football as an industry, but there is still always that conflict of having to feel that you're trying to basically push your way and find your niche in what a lot of existing kind of players or existing men feel is their space and that you are invading. So, yeah, there's there's always challenges as around that. And I would say that certainly being a woman has probably been the biggest sort of, you know, I'd say sort of space maker uh, for me when I'm sort of going into the football world rather than the colour of my skin. Uh, yeah, hopefully that makes some sense. It absolutely does. And I love, of course, I respect everyone's take. You know, if somebody had come on and had a really negative experience and voiced then that negativity, I would have still embraced that. But I just want to say as well that I absolutely love your take on it as well, because I think your take on how your experience has been sort of like um, impacted or coloured. I didn't want to say coloured, excuse the pun, but um it's just kind of reflects who you are as a person, I would say, because your messaging on the race issue and your messaging on how you started your business were literally the same message. And I just wanted to highlight that because I think it's such a beautiful thing. There's obviously room for improvement in the sports industry. Now we're far away from like the bans being lifted in the 70s. And now we've seen more things. We've seen the euros or the record number of tickets that are being sold. But there is still room for improvement within the sports industry, especially when it comes to representation. What kind of changes are you hoping to see in the near future when it comes to just making more improvements and kind of going harder in that direction of just that ideal industry that we would all like to be a part of, which is equal, which is diverse, which is inclusive? Yeah, I totally agree that you know we've definitely seen positive developments but again you know tacking back to my theme of having a balanced view you know there have been great developments and strides forward particularly in recent years with women's sport but if you look at the picture across the world and across different sports it's not an even picture and actually, if you look overall at the investment that's going into women's sport versus, say, the, the overall sports economy, you know, women's sport still only gets a fraction of that um, investment. So what we need to do is clearly, you know, encourage and, you know, celebrate some of the progress that's been made. But still, women's sport is fundamentally under invested in, particularly when you consider that half of the population of world is, is female. So I, I want to see that positive momentum continue so that we see that kind of roll through into investment from, you know, brands, you know, sponsors, um, increasing investment into the, the sports at the grassroots level all the way through to the elite teams. You know, as an example, like yesterday, England women, OK, it's a bit unfair in terms of Luxembourg's a small country, but you know, England women played Luxembourg uh, in the World Cup qualification game. England already qualified, so it's not even like there was any pressure riding on the fixture. They beat Luxembourg 10-0. And actually, if you look at their World Cup qualification campaign, you know, their goal difference is plus 80. You know, they are absolutely thrashing teams. So as good as the England women's team is an example of what happens when you invest in women's football, that also raises the question about, What's happening elsewhere? You know, I don't want to watch matches where England are winning 10 nil, 10 nil, 20 nil, etc. I want, you know, all the boats to rise at a reasonably similar speed. So I think what we need to do is celebrate the progress we've made, 
but really focus on making sure that it continues to increase and those areas that are lagging behind um, geographically as well as functionally, you know, some of the sort of technical roles uh, on and off the pitch, that we make sure that we get more women uh, involved in it and encourage more to enter those fields. Love that. And if we would move the perspective to, to you, what, what would you say your biggest ambition when it comes to the impact you want to make in the sports industry would be? Cool. That's a um, that's always the the big if, right? So, you know, yes, I want to rule the world, sort of thing. No, what <laughs> I, I think, like I said, I just want my company to have really made a, a positive impact to the things that we've talked about. You know, we we've talked about the development of women's sport. You know, I want people to, in in ten years' time, hopefully, CSU is is still existing in some shape or form it might be a different name it might be part of a you know a different corporate structure but I I want people to cite us as one of the you know one of the companies or whatever that help to contribute to you know the growth of women's sport I want us to be seen as you know one of those companies that help to develop and contribute towards the growth of the African sports ecosystem this is this is what I want in the end so Ultimately, you know, if I can look back in 10, 20 years time and be able to pinpoint areas where we've made a positive impact, both on an individual basis to, you know, players and coaches or clubs, etc., but also on a broader basis to the particular to the industry. That's what I want to see. I, I, I just want to know that we've made a positive impact and, and be able to demonstrate that we have. Love that. Um to any women in the sport uh, in sports out there that are listening right now and also to any men out there who want to be allies of women in sports uh, what advice would you give them again that's a um, fiendishly difficult question to answer i would say look i think just reach out and listen to the people in the space so if you're an ally potentially uh, who wants to get involved in the space reach out, listen, and really then work out how you can make a positive impact. To the fellow women in, in the industry, look, the industry overall, sports industry, it's, it's you know, we're, we're working in an industry that's about com- competition, you know, particularly the high performance ed, you know, when it comes to, you know, working in football, you know, it, it's very competitive and it can become very, very cutthroat. And again, I think it's easy to lose sight of, the you know the reason or the you know the utility that you have you know as a as a woman you know working in the sports industry and that is you're you're there to support the actors whether they be the players the clubs etc you know they're the ones who are making the stories they're the ones who are writing the narrative or the backdrop for people's lives right so we're the support we're the supporters you know to that industry and I think that's what we've always got to focus on and help each other and you know if if you've got a contact that maybe might be of utility to someone else um but isn't necessarily one that's of immediate utility to yourself maybe rather than being quite so you know tight about it maybe sharing a little bit more because i think as women in the industry our voices can get more and more powerful if we're more collaborative and there, there's some of us who are doing great stuff around being collaborative but, you know, I'm not going to paint a blanket rosy picture. There, there's some women who I feel are, you know, they're there to kind of make themselves stand out a little bit. But there isn't really, I get the sense that they really want to kind of be collaborative and help to help other women within the industry. So let's just be collaborative. Let's help each other out. Uh, let's, you know, let's be positive. I know it's uh, it's probably going to be a really annoying phrase for me now. And yeah, and we know that we can continue to build this momentum that is finally starting to build around the women's sport. Awesome. Now, Lindy, before we round off, is there anything exciting that you are currently working on that our listeners after this episode, they can check out and maybe kind of get in contact with you or just get to know you a little bit better? I think, you know, first of all, obviously, the obvious shop window for us is some of the stuff that we're doing with players. Uh, there's some obviously player moves that haven't been announced yet that have been agreed over the last um, few weeks that will come through. And again, like I said, with the theme with regards to some of the African players, I'm really pleased to have 
found some great kind of opportunities uh, for some of the African players, uh, who, which you will kind of see on our socials if you watch the tapes there. And then, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, I'm a great believer in trying to build the African ecosystem. And, you know, I think that the way the future is digital, let's just accept that. Let's not fight against it and, you know, gnash, it, gnash our teeth and pull our hair about it. The future is digital. And I know that, you know, Africa as a continent can really seriously benefit from the development of sport and in particular the digital transformation of sport. So keep an eye on that space. I, I'm working with a, a company called Block Sport who very much are in the area of building digital ecosystems for clubs, federations and leagues. And the way they're doing it is a way that ties in with what I believe in from the beginning. It's about developing long term relationships. So have a look at what CC is bringing with Block Sport. We've got some exciting announcements to come up in the next few weeks on that side as well. Lindy, thank you so much for an incredible conversation. I guess for, we learned everything from like transferable skills to how to start a business, to how to just live your life, be positive, be balanced, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I really, really appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. Thank you for having me. If your goal is to get more supporters, superior sales and real revenue, then visit our website at datatalks.sc and fill out our demo form to experience firsthand how we can help you. Data Talks, more supporters, superior sales, real revenue.